Hey, all you cool cats and kittens. Welcome to Mile Higher Podcast, episode 136. I'm Carol Baskin, and today I'm joined with Joe Exotic. Yeah, I don't know why I'm here. (laughs) Why am I here right now? Because we've been asked to host this Halloween episode of Mile Higher Podcast. Well. And it's our first time together since Tiger King came out, so... I'm just happy to get out of the clanger for a little bit. Yeah, you've been locked up. How's it been? Uh, It's been hell, Carol. All (laughs) thanks to you. (laughs) Well, I'm doing quite well. I have a whole extra tiger sanctuary thanks to you because I got all of your tigers when you went into jail. Yeah, well, guess what? When I get out of jail, I'm coming for you, Carol. (laughs) I'm coming for you hard and fast like a cheetah. Well, if you ever get out. (laughs) Oh, I'm going to get out, Carol. Don't you worry about that. They've let him come out for one episode of Mile Higher Podcast on parole, but you do have an ankle bracelet. <laughs> that literally shocks me if I was a step foot outside of this building. So you better not do that. Oh, you better be careful. You better watch her back, Carol. <laughs> they did not pat me down when I came in here. <laughs> but yeah, I'm happy to be here. And, you know, jail's been kind of hard for my mullet and my, my hair and my shirts. I'm getting fat in jail. They they feed you bologna sandwiches every day. I can't fit in my beautiful tiger shirts and clothing anymore. I'm busting out of it, all right? It's very uncomfortable. <laughs> well, I thought I would bring you something that would make you feel better. Do you want to see? You know, maybe. It's one of your tigers from your old sanctuary that I now own. Which one is it? Um... Her name is Shirley the Tiger. Shirley? Come here, Shirley. Come on, Shirley. She must have been one of those on. little cubs that I had. Oh, wow. Shirley. Oh, wow. Yes, I know that one. This is Shirley. I've renamed her Shirley. I'm sure she had some stupid name when you were her owner. <laughs> yeah, it was Medusa. Yeah, she likes me much better. <laughs> Sick him, boy. Wow. Sick him, girl. <laughs> the, I didn't know you hiss like a cat. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's great to be back with some uh, friendly uh, furry faces, I guess. But what about that Dancing with the Stars, Carol? We were dying in jail watching you get booted off to the Lion King song. Well, yes. Actually, I did uh, get booted off after that one. Lion King was my final performance. But I do feel like I raised awareness for the Tigers in the, I think, uh, three, three to four episodes that I was on. And no one has taste, so... You know, they booted me off, but it was a great experience and I did it for the Tigers. Well, sadly, we are not going to perform the entire episode today in our voices. We're going to have to be a little bit of a mix of our real selves. So you're going to be Josh Exotic. That is correct. And I am Kendall Baskin. And we are here to actually do a true crime case for the last episode of Crimetober. We are covering the case of Lisa French and Gerald Turner, otherwise known as the Halloween killer or the case that canceled Halloween. We're actually in costume because we are doing an episode of The Sesh right after this, and four of us, well, actually five of us are going to be in costume for that episode. So you'll have to go check it out. We are carving pumpkins. So if you would like to see that episode, we're telling scary stories, like short stories, and telling some uh, subscriber scary stories as well. So it should be a good time. There'll be a link down below. This episode of the Malhar Podcast is brought to you by HelloFresh, Stamps.com, and CandidCO. And with that being said, let's go ahead and get into the first news story. And it is about my brother, Doc Antill. And this has been flying under the radar, folks. Yeah, and it I, has. It, it really has. Mm-hmm. I mean, a lot of people don't even know that this is going on. But no. my buddy, Doc, is in some hot water right now. Deep shit. So for those that don't know, he goes by Bhagavan, right? It's called Bhagavan. No, he goes by Doc. His real name is Bhagavan. Bhagavan Antel. And if you ever if you watch my documentary, Tiger King, you know about Doc. And Doc is a really good guy. He's been growing tigers and breeding tigers and other cats and wildlife for a very long time. He also rescues them. And he owns a private zoo in South Carolina called Myrtle Beach Safari. Right? Yep. Mm-hmm. And Doc was not very happy with how he was portrayed in Tiger King. Uh, he was very upset about that. And, yeah. and I mm-hmm. told those damn producers that they better, they better make him look good. And they did the actual opposite thing. 
They made him look like a criminal, and they landed my ass in jail. So well, really, Tiger King, Tiger King did not work out for us. But basically what <laughs> happened was, is back in August of 2019, there was another individual named Keith Wilson who we do do business with. You know what I mean? We <laughs> we, we trade tigers and animals and, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And apparently he got raided by the authorities and they seized 119 animals, including tigers, bears, lions, goats, camels, water buffalo, and more from his zoo. Damn. Lions, tigers, and bears. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> and then the animal law unit that's investigating us went to Antel's property in December of 2019 and conducted a search there as well. And after that, they charged both Doc Antel and his two daughters, Tawny Antel and Telecam Watterson, with misdemeanor counts of cruelty to animals and violating the Endangered Species Act. Shit. What kind of crap is that? <laughs> they doing nothing but good things over there, and they getting locked up for animal abuse. He he shows you everything. The animals don't look abused to me. You don't think so? Absolutely well, you didn't have the not. best conditions at your zoo. Hey, you know what? My my tigers ate real good. That Walmart meat, <laughs> top quality stuff. Oh my fucking god! They had as many hot dogs as they wanted to. <laughs> but no, I mean Doc Antel. He's he's been running his safari. People have gone to the safari. He's got five star reviews on Yelp. Yeah, it, his son's pretty big on Instagram, Cody. Yeah, Cody's big on Instagram. You can go visit it. Well, I don't know. It might be shut down now that the I don't know they done a I charged him with some. Some serious charges. He'll be he'll be my roommate, my cellmate here soon. <laughs> if he gets, uh, yeah, I was going to say maybe charges. you won't be as lonely once your buddy Doc's in there with you. You guys can t talk about the days where you were allowed to have tigers. <laughs> That's not going to be too fun for me or for Doc. No, but Doc is innocent, man. He denies all <laughs> charges. He is innocent until proven guilty, and there oh. is nothing that he has done. He claims. Well, we'll have to see. We'll have to see about that. We will have to see, but I, I don't know. I, I, I really don't want right, to see Joe. him join me here in, in prison because <laughs> it ain't fun in here. I can't wait to the day I get to go back to my tires. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's Doc's uh, Doc store. Anyways, right. you're done with that accent from here forward. That is, that is done. Anyways, <laughs> Josh exotic here. He's I'm back. Yet you still can't help but have a little bit of an accent. Yeah. Because I can't move my That's going to stick for the rest of the day. Josh Exotic is back. Josh is <laughs> And I'm telling you that Demi Lovato has posted on Instagram that she has communicated with alien beings. Yes. She has seen UFOs because, because she recently went on a CE5 expedition with Dr. Stephen Greer. Expedition into Joshua Tree National Forest is where they go to, or park where they go to communicate with the aliens. Yeah, that's something we've always wanted to do. We talked about this last week. We did. I was curious if she would actually see anything out there. It sounds like she saw a lot. Yeah, there's actually a, a clip of her with uh, Dr. Greer if you want to play that real quick. Roll it. Hello, I'm Demi Lovato. And, and I'm Dr. Stephen Greer. And we are here in Joshua Tree, California National Park, and we are going to make contact with ETs, or we're going to attempt to. And I don't know if you want to tell people more about that. Um, I do. Yeah, please do. <laughs> you want to mention what happened on your birthday? Well, yes. So first of all, um, if anybody uh, has seen the documentary Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind or has heard of the Disclosure Project that was started by this guy right here. And um, if you've seen those documentaries and I'm talking serious and acknowledged Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind, then you know exactly who he is. But um, I, I had watched all of those and... Um, for at my birthday, I wanted to um, try to make contact, and I ended up having an experience that was just completely like you couldn't debunk it. And um, what what I and six of my closest friends saw was 
uh, just completely yeah and you couldn't debunk it so um i wanted to i immediately um got in touch with dr stephen greer and um you know there's a really important uh purpose that he has and um and i think that if our audiences meaning my my fan base and um, the people that follow his work kind of align together we could possibly shift the direction of the planet into a um, more positive direction what do you think about that i think it's awesome and i've always loved demi lovato but this makes me love her so much more what a badass she is out there in the desert with dr street stephen greer that is trying to communicate aliens i'm well it sounds like they did they did she said you can't debunk it so can we see it I wonder well, if they captured it. Well, so there is some pictures that she posted on an Instagram post in a little video, which uh, oh, is yeah, kind of right. really short. But she captured two really interesting images of light orbs is what essentially they look like. One is blue and one is orange. The orange one is actually a video post that she made that shows it actually going across the sky. But the fact, I mean, look at these things. Do they look like anything man-made no. just off first glance? Absolutely not. I mean, what is that? That's not an aircraft. That's not an aircraft. No. And they're glowing. They're they're glowing. They're emitting this glow, this orange and blue glow to them. And in the Instagram posts, it, I, I thought it was very interesting that she and cool that she said this to all. I mean, she has millions and millions yeah. of followers. And to well, like five, put oh, this, probably way more than that. How it's many? like 50. 50 million. million five yeah, it's million. like 50, 50 million followers, I believe, somewhere around there. Wow. And it says the past few days I spent in Joshua tree with a small group of loved ones and Dr. Steven Greer and his CE five team over the past couple months, I have dug deep into the science of consciousness and experienced not only peace and serenity, like I've never known, but I also have witnessed the most incredibly profound sightings, both in the sky as well as feet away from me. Cause that's one of the things during CE five encounters is that, you know, it's not just seeing UFOs in the sky. There's actual moments where light beings literally, show up right in front of you or right beside you or or you see and, orbs yeah yeah orbs are literal like i mean that's how they look like to our eyes is like mm. orbs of light but if you right. capture them on camera you can actually make out uh he has the famous one that we've talked about in the past mm -hmm. where you can actually see the outline of what looks to be some type of being of some sort show up at, at the camp it's just it's really incredible what they're able to capture out there it is i would love to go on one of these i mean i'm so jealous we were hoping that one day maybe because at one point we were in contact with dr greer but he's a lot more famous now than he was back then like he contacted me to be on my channel in like 2017 before then, unacknowledged came out yeah, yeah. and then it, we, that it blew didn't up. Go, yeah. yeah it didn't work out and then um but yeah I would love to at least talk to him in my life. I think it is so oh, we cool will. that we will. she acknowledges what a special human he is. I think he truly is. Yeah, definitely. I, I agree. I mean, I've, I've read his books and stuff and his story is very, very interesting. And, you know, people love to throw him, you know, under the bus and say, this is all oh, yeah. fraud, fake for money and whatnot. It's like, how well, they're, you know, they like, can have that opinion, but I disagree. Because I, I mean, like his really the way that I look at him is he's kind of like a a beacon of light spiritually because he's trying to wake us all up to mm -hmm. you know raising our consciousness and meditation and how how important it is to not only meditate but to you know continuously meditate so that you can reach higher states of consciousness where mm -hmm. you're able to actually communicate with other life forms that are out there because that's how that's how you communicate with them is. Uh, telepathically like mm -hmm. through through meditation through thought that's how they communicate there's no like verbal exchange it's all through thought which is really cool i love what she said about how she wants to share this to encourage people to make a better world and head in a better direction than the one that we're headed into now that's really interesting and that's an another thing that i just love about dr greer is he is all about that. He is all about raising society in a more positive way. Cause I know he, he's smart enough that he can see it both ways. Right. You know, that's right. hard to do. Yeah. But we are either going to go down one path or we're going to go down a different path. Yeah. And technology and that kind of stuff can either help us or it's going to be the end. Right. <laughs> that got really dark, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, we I mean, need it's to be a vital time. Yeah. We are in a vital time. Yeah. We have to become united and, and see the bigger, bigger picture here. Like we got to see beyond our planet. We got to see beyond, 
to the human race. We have yeah. to look at like this big expansive universe that's out there and, you know, bring ourselves to the next level of consciousness. Yeah. Pretty much. Move our civilization up on the scale a little bit. Like yeah. we got to move forward. We're moving at a snail pace right now, mm-hmm. but basically what Demi Lovato and Dr. Greer are saying is that through meditation and, you know, if you're interested in making contact through their CE five app, uh, teaches you the protocols. Cause there's a, there's a method to it. It's not so just wait, meditating. He has an app. Does she have, is it her yes. app? No, it's his app. Okay. So she's just helping. I yes. wonder if there's any type of like, is this a sponsorship or did she just want, she's just, a she fan probably, of I Greer. think she probably just reached out to him and was like, can you take me on an expedition? I've used your app and he's, is a, the app free? No, the app is not free. Hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, people will definitely, right. Be the app's $10. So that. people are well, saying it's pretty high. You know, she's promoting the app, so but, that's a lot of money he's going to make. Yeah. But if you really $10 get- to make contact with <laughs> aliens, guys. Like, that's a bargain. So if I, you know, download it right now, am I going to make contact with aliens, though? No, not necessarily. <laughs> but Demi Lovato did with the app. After well, she claims after so many times. She's with the man himself. Well, let's go try it. Let's go. <laughs> I want to go out there with him and so, see this for myself. That's the, my only thing is I've never had any type of... Uh, even a paranormal experience or anything to do with aliens or you, I've never seen a UFO. I want to see something. Well, here's what we got to do. Okay. We got to go back down to, cause Dr. Greer all used to do expeditions here in Colorado actually. Right. Um, but he doesn't anymore. He, he doesn't do them all here. He anymore? does them in California and Joshua tree. Damn it. I thought yeah. we could maybe like, tag I know on, that. Well, if he was going to come back here. out here at any point, maybe we could hit him up and say, Hey, can we Yo, do Greer, something? Come on. Yeah. Look, yeah, it'd be cool. Cause we could go down to, you know, the San Luis Valley Crestone area. That's that's a really good place to do this type of stuff. So I don't know. I, I think it's really interesting. And definitely if you have never heard of Dr. Greer or, you know, you're interested in this kind of stuff, we'll leave links for you below. Definitely watch his documentaries. It really lays everything out perfectly. If you're new to UFOs and aliens and you're like, what are these people talking about? Like you guys sound crazy. Yeah. Well, like, yeah. I'm sure that's how it sounds. It does sound crazy. I'm sure a lot of people yeah. listen to this and think this is insane. Well, people are like, oh, Demi's back on drugs. And like oh, the, that's amount, terrible. the amount of negative comments I saw on oh. a lot of these videos reporting about Demi Lovato, you know, oh, talking about this really? is really negative and people making fun of it being like, this is just a bunch of bullshit. It's all money that's grab sad. and she's back on drugs and that's why she's seeing aliens. It's, it's just like, wow, this world needs to, to open their mind. A How bit offensive. More. Yeah, yeah. Seriously. That's so, offensive. especially for her. So many, yeah. right. Especially her, but that's just, a, that's so ridiculous. Sorry. Mm-hmm. I'm just, wow. Well. Ridiculous. It's just like, I mean, there's a lot of closed minded people out there and they're not willing to even consider the possibility that maybe this is right. You know, maybe mm-hmm. it isn't obviously there's always a chance that this isn't really what's happening, yeah. but I think there's enough evidence being put right. forward that's showing. And th- when you actually hear him explain how mm-hmm. this works and his credentials and how, yeah, I mean, he's got a medical degree. He knows something about consciousness in the human body and how, how this works too yeah. in the past, mm-hmm. what he's worked on. He's just, Yeah. I take him really seriously. I think people need to actually listen to him before they just write him and off. try it. I mean, try it for yourself before you just say, Oh, that's just, you know, it's just a money grab or whatever. Before try you say the something meditating like that. for yeah. aliens. Yeah, exactly. How come you haven't tried it? Well, <laughs> one showed up in my room and we had, Oh, a, okay. I saw him and we had a chit chit chat for a bit. We had a chit. <laughs> yeah. A chit. <laughs> Played a couple video games and then, uh, yeah, he took Played some among us. Yeah, you know. Oh yeah. By the way, join our Discord. We, Josh and I've been playing Hella Among Us with our subscribers on oh, there. It's really fun. Wouldn't it be cool if they sponsored our show? Among, Among Us? Us? Yeah. I don't think they are sponsoring anybody. <laughs> that would be cool though. I would be very happy about that. It's a very cool game. Anyway, do we have any other topics? This is cool though. And we've talked about the the Nazca lines before. We've talked about the Nazca yeah. Desert down in Peru. And they actually discovered a cat etching into a, a lookout point called Mirador Natural. And they noticed a barely visible cat on the hillside. This is carved in there and this is old. This has been there for a very, very long time. Dated back 200 to 100 BCE, part of the late Paracas period. So this is extremely old. And the Nazca lines, if you're not familiar with them, are basically huge drawings in the soil of the Nazca Desert. I mean, they're 
freaking mm-hmm. huge. Like you can only see them really from a far, far point away. And a lot of them are on completely flat desert. So you can only see them from the air. But these, this ancient civilization carved these drawings into the land somehow perfectly. I mean, look at, look at some of these drawings, the mm-hmm. cat, I'm the cat definitely a little bit more, eh. You know, it's, but look at this like spider that they they did. Just this, like the math, it's so symmetrical and perfect. Yeah, it reminds me of crop circles. It would be very difficult to do. Not saying they couldn't do it, and that's a misconception I want to clear up. Josh and I don't believe that there's no chance that ancient civilizations could have built the pyramids, could have done the Nazca lines. We think that there definitely is a possibility that it really was just the civilization. But we like to consider options yeah or or maybe there was some intermediary device or technology or help Mm -hmm. that assisted them with some of the things maybe possibly yeah maybe we consider all possibilities we don't rule anything out that's how we try to approach especially like ancient history we're not saying that you know somebody who studied this civilization for years and years and years doesn't know what they're talking about we're just saying that maybe there's other reasons for why you know this particular thing came about or you know somebody made this you know you got to consider all possibilities Mm -hmm. because they're they're we don't know at the end of the day you can look at you know these things all day long and Mm -hmm. you can only get gen you know generalized time periods you don't know exactly when it was made we don't know why like the nazca lines nobody knows why archaeologists are like we we don't know why they literally say because it was assigned to the you know it was either some type of Mm -hmm you know, way to track the night sky, or it was a way to signal to deities or something like that. That's Mm -hmm. what they say for the Nazca lines. That sounds the most reasonable that it was a way to like kind of speak to the gods or honor them. But why a spider and a cat? I don't know. That's the thing. And a lot of these uh, drawings too, or I guess they really, what are they? Etchings Etchings. in in the ground. Yeah. In the soil. Yeah. um, A lot of them aren't, like they, they look like a bug, but it's not a bug that actually exists. For example, you know, like the head of this bug has like three prongs and it has four legs and there it's just like not actual things. And there's plenty of those examples where they don't actually look like the real animal or anything that exists today, at least they look Maybe like symbols of things. stuff. Yeah. They look more like symbols. Right. So, you know, like if you look at it from a point of view as these are travel markers like first of all why would if everybody's on the ground during this period of time why would they want these types of travel markers they can't see the whole thing right because if you're traveling on the ground there's no way to see the entire picture Mm. unless you're in the air so why was an ancient civilization making travel markers for the air then you got to think about that possibility was there you know somebody flying around in the air at this point in time in history well, I feel like you could make a more simple travel marker, like maybe right. an arrow or yeah. like a circle. I mean, these are pretty intricate and they look difficult and there's so many of them. Right. I don't know. I don't think that was their purpose personally, but, but it's still sure. a mystery. It's mm-hmm. still a complete mystery as to why they did this. And you know, what, what's the purpose? Why doesn't make any sense at all. Why would they spend all this time doing these giant etchings in the soil? So why was this news this week? Because they found this cat. They found a cat? Yeah, they found this cat etched into the side of this hill. And that's the a new one. They keep finding more and more Nazca lines or Nazca etchings. Wow, so that was amazing. They can miss them for so yeah, long. Yeah, they still are finding them. There's st- more and more out there. Yeah, it's really wild. All right, you ready to get into today's case? Let's go ahead and get into the Halloween killer, the case that canceled Halloween. I've gotten this one requested so many times and not going to lie. I've kind of avoided doing it because it's yeah, it's it's brutal, man. It is like, yeah, we've been having fun on this episode, but it's a pretty intense case. It is very serious. Um, Just because I think it's, it's about trick or treating as a child. And, you know, most of us know what that's like and that innocence. And it's just, it's yeah. (laughs) It's scary to think about, especially for young kids going Mm -hmm. out. I mean, obviously nowadays kids don't really go out trick or treating by themselves unless they're like in their teenage years. And we mean by themselves, like completely alone. Right. Exactly. Um, Which we'll explain more, but yeah, most kids at least go in groups, but 
I would be nervous nowadays, trick or treating. Well, it's like you never know whose house you're going to go to. Yeah. Because, I, I mean, how well do you know your neighbors? Yeah. I definitely wouldn't let my kids trick or treat by themselves. No way. No way. No way. Because, yeah, I mean, in some neighborhoods, it's not like there's herds of people coming to every house. You could be the only kid going up to a, yeah. a house on the corner where nobody else is around and mm -hmm. you have no idea who's inside. Yeah, that's absolutely true. You don't you don't always know your neighbors. No. And this case definitely shows you that. It definitely does. But before we get into that, we'd like to thank our sponsors for today. This holiday season, more people will be mailing stuff than ever before. That means the post office is going to be busy, people. You don't have time for that. Stamps.com brings the post office and now UPS shipping right to your computer. Mail and ship anything from the convenience of your living room or your office. With Stamps.com, anything you can do at the post office, you can do with just a few clicks. Plus, Stamps.com saves you money with deep discounts that you can't even get at the post office. Stamps.com brings all of the U.S. Postal Service and UPS services right to your computer. Stamps.com is a must-have for any business, including mine. Whether you're a small office sending out invoices or an online seller fulfilling orders during this record-setting holiday season, or you're even a giant warehouse sending thousands of packages a day, Stamps.com has got your back. Simply use your computer to print out official U.S. postage 24-7 for any letter, any package, any class of mail, anywhere you want to send. Once your mail is ready, just schedule a pickup or drop it off. It's that simple. With Stamps.com, you get $0.05 cents off every first-class stamp and up to 40% off priority mail and up to 62% off them UPS shipping rates. Not to mention, it's just a fraction of the cost of those expansive postage meters. So Stamps.com is a no-brainer. It saves you time and money, and it's no wonder over 900,000 small businesses already use Stamps.com. Don't spend a minute of your holiday season at the post office this year. Sign up for Stamps.com instead. There's no risk, and with my promo code MileHire, you'll get a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a digital scale and no long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to Stamps.com and click on the microphone at the top of the homepage and type in Mile Hire. That's Stamps.com. Enter Mile Hire. Stamps.com. Never go to the post office again. Sometimes in 2020, it feels like every day is the same. But it doesn't have to be that way when it comes to your meals. Thanks to HelloFresh, they can help you switch it up every day and get out of your recipe rut. HelloFresh lets you skip trips to the grocery store completely and makes cooking easy, fun, and affordable. HelloFresh delivers exactly what you need to cook a specific meal in the exact portions that you need. HelloFresh cuts out the stressful meal planning and it's really, really easy to do. Most of their meals take only about 30 minutes to make. Some of them even are like 20 minutes. And you can save around 40% by using HelloFresh versus shopping at your local grocery store. And one thing that we love about HelloFresh is that 90% of their ingredients are sourced directly from growers to ensure that the freshest recipes are delivered right to your door. Last night, Josh and I made a really good chicken creamy pasta with lemon, basil, and roasted tomatoes, and it was really, really good. And it's really easy to customize based on your food preference or delivery days. You can easily skip a week if you ever need to or up your meals if someone's going to be staying with you. And feeding the whole family has never been easier with their larger box sizes for even more savings and even more servings. So check it out. It is America's number one meal kit. And you can get $80 off your first HelloFresh box at HelloFresh.com slash 80 mile higher using the code 80 mile higher. And that will get you $80 off across five boxes, including free shipping on your first box. Again, that's HelloFresh.com slash 80 mile higher using the code 80 mile higher at checkout. Straightening your teeth is simpler, easier, and more comfortable than ever. Thanks to Candid Clear Aligners are comfortable, they're removable, and they're practically invisible unlock those wire braces so you can transform your smile without anyone noticing plus your treatment is prescribed and monitored remotely by a licensed orthodontist who's an expert in tooth movement and it's all done from the comfort and convenience of your home canon only works with orthodontists never those general dentists like other companies do Plus, your supervising orthodontist will be with you every step of the way. With Candid, your treatment includes remote monitoring by the same orthodontist who created your plan, so you'll never have to wonder how you're doing. You'll always know. And I love that. The average Candid treatment is just six months, people. 
You'll start seeing results way before then though, and it costs thousands of dollars less than traditional braces. So start straightening your teeth today. Right now, all my listeners can save $75 on Candid Starter Kit. Go to candidco.com slash milehire and use code milehire. That's candidco.com slash milehire and use code milehire. Take advantage of this limited time offer to save $75 on your starter kit. CandidCO.com slash milehire code milehire folks. All right. So Lisa Ann French was born on June 2nd, 1964 in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. Fond du Lac is on the Southern shore of Lake Winnebago in Fond du Lac County. And historically it's named as one of the top 20 safest cities in the United States. But recently, in 2020, it was actually ranked 138th just in Wisconsin. So it's a dangerous-ass place now. Yeah. And these it, rankings, I'm always like, uh, they just fluctuate. Like, crime goes up and down depending. It's I like know. how anybody that's basing on anything on these safe city rankings. like It's like this can happen anywhere. Yeah. Bad people can live anywhere. Right. You it know? doesn't, like, eliminate your chances of, of a crime happening to you just because it's a safe city. I know in so many documentaries, they always bring that up. Yeah. Like, oh, it was such a safe place. No one expected it. And I, and I like, get that to some extent, like yeah. there are places where there's very, very little crime, very little violent crime, especially. Mm -hmm. And so when something horrific happens, it does really send shock waves through the, the town, you know? Cause yeah. I mean, understandably, especially this, because if I had kids and I lived in this community, I would be really freaked out by this even today. In the early 1970s, it seemed like any other Midwestern small town in America. And it really looks like one of those, you know, movies. Off it does. Of, like a Halloween movie. This picture reminds me of like Halloween Town or something. Walking home from school, Macaulay Culkin or something. I don't think he's in that, but it kind of looks like the straight off of like Home Alone. Lisa French lived at 192 Armory Street in Northeast Wisconsin with her mother and her stepfather, who are named Marianne and Bruce DePau, and her baby brother named Michael. And her father, Alan French, owned a duplex in their neighborhood, so they lived close by. And on Halloween night in 1973, Lisa was nine years old. She was a fourth grader at Chegwin Elementary School. And she's a very cute little girl. She had brown eyes, shaggy brown hair, a uh, very bright and friendly smile, and was missing her few front teeth. So just had that really cute, you know, kid look. And her mom worked in a hair salon, actually. So she would, you know, give her the latest, cutest haircuts. Yeah, and, and that looks like a 70s cut to me mm -hmm. if you look at a picture of her at the, around that time. Yeah, she was really cute. Lisa's best friend, Ann Parker, described her as funny, bubbling, and outgoing. That Halloween, Armory Street was lit up. Almost every house had the porch lights on for trick-or-treaters. And one block over on East Bank Street, a group of parents were hosting a block party called Pumpkin Place. Hell yeah. Block party. Yeah, that sounds really fun. Around this time, there were a lot of Halloween candy poisonings. We yeah. talked about a few. Yeah. Um, and razors in candy apples or razors put in candy. Savage. Who this would, happened who a that? lot back in the day. I don't know why you would want to do that. What is that going to do other I than cut just, poor kids' hands up? Yeah. And that freaks me out so much to this day. Like when I have kids, I'm going to be that type of mom that's opening sealed candy to make sure that it's okay. Because I feel like someone could easily put something in something and then reseal it. You know, they have those little, we have a resealer yeah, for chip bags and now. stuff. Yeah. I don't know. It creeps me out. I would be super careful if I was a parent, but that's why they created this whole pumpkin place. It was a safe place that kids in the neighborhood could go to trick or treat and they can really monitor what's being given out. Lisa and Anne had planned to go to pumpkin place together and meet another friend there as well. But that night Anne got in trouble and was grounded. So she was not allowed to go out for Halloween. So this left Lisa alone for Halloween night and she decided she still wanted to go to pumpkin place and her parents decided that she could go and they actually let her trick or treat at a few houses in their neighborhood along the way to pumpkin place. As long as it was houses of people that she knew. Which no harm in that. I mean, yeah. if you know, I mean, she's old enough to know different people and be able to, you know, go to the right houses. Mm -hmm. So, but also that does there, you know, a young child like that, somebody might be able to, you know, lure them into somewhere else. Mm-hmm. 
And Lisa was so excited to be able to go out and trick or treat by herself and go to this, you know, you feel like an adult kind of when you finally get to go out trick or treating alone. She raced through dinner that night and she was going to be dressing up as a butterfly, but then it was too cold out. So her mom helped her create a cute little hobo costume instead, which I love that. She bundled her up in a green parka with masking tape covering her jeans and a floppy hat. And the final touch was painting cute little freckles on her face. She left the house after dark about 6 p.m. and had a 7 p.m. curfew. So she wasn't planning to be out long. No, one hour. Yeah. She knew three houses in their neighborhood. The first belonged to a teacher named Karen. The second was a house across the street where one of Lisa's classmates lived. And the third was the home of Gerald Miles Turner Jr., 152 Rose Avenue. So Gerald at this time was in his mid-20s. And he actually worked as a machinist for the So Line Railroad. And he was divorced and had two kids. A few months before Halloween, he had rented the other side of Alan French's duplex in the neighborhood. Him and his girlfriend, Arlene Penn, had recently moved into a house nearby with their baby. And Lisa liked Gerald. She'd visit him to chat, play on his porch with the baby, or take the baby on walks in a stroller. Gerald was a family friend, and Lisa had no reason to be afraid of him. What her and her parents didn't know about Gerald was that the year before, he had actually been charged with the statutory rape of a 15-year-old babysitter. But apparently the charges actually got dropped and nothing really came of it. He was never punished for this or, I guess, proven that he actually did this. So as far as we know, Lisa left the house to go to visit the three houses. But by seven o'clock when her curfew was, you know, she was supposed to be home. She never came home. The curfew came and went. And for a little while, her mother, Marianne, didn't really think much of it. And she was like, oh, you know, she'll probably be back. She's just running a little bit late. But by around 730 p.m., she started to worry. And soon after that, she decided to call the police because she knew something was not right. And by 10 p.m., a search was underway for little Lisa, led by Detective Melvin Heller. The local PTA was well organized and actually had a program called Block Parents, led by a woman named Betty Waffle. She started calling parents in the neighborhood immediately to ask if they had seen Lisa. And that night, about 50 families were contacted about Lisa's disappearance. And they all sprung into action immediately, turning on their porch lights and putting signs on their windows to give information about missing Lisa. Over 5,000 people volunteered to help look for her, but she was nowhere to be found. Yeah, the whole community pretty much. That's, I mean, it's a small area. 5,000 people. Yeah. Yeah, literally the whole town. People were freaked out by this. Yeah, just a little girl just disappeared. It's so scary. And I feel so bad for her parents. Because they clearly, it's not like they were careless and they just let her let her go no. out on her own. You know, they did tell her only go to certain people's house and she was supposed to be going to the safe area. So it's just, it's so sad. I'm sure to them, they're like, what, what happened? Because she, they yeah. knew that their child would only go to these three yeah. houses. So she was only supposed to be gone an hour and mm-hmm. they lost her in an hour. Yeah. Oh, such a short amount of time. It breaks my heart. Yeah. It's really sad. Eventually, they widened the search parameters and the police dragged the local rivers and lakes because, I mean, after a certain point that somebody goes missing, you know, the the method for searching changes and they start considering that, you know, perhaps this person is deceased. So we need to look in places where somebody would likely dump a body. So that's why they're starting to look in the rivers, fields, things like that. A local Photoshop actually printed 6,000 posters with Lisa's school picture and description on it, and everybody started posting these everywhere. Basically a missing poster. Local gas stations offered anyone helping with the search 25 gallons of free gas, and everyone in the community was out searching for Lisa. That's awesome. They should do that nowadays. No, they would never do that. Free gas, even one gallon, if someone would go out and help search or something. Well, it's probably because this gas station was like a little ma pa locally yeah. owned type of place. Now these big corporate owned gas stations don't don't care at all. And they could be doing the most, which is the saddest part. Yeah, I know. That Saturday morning, November third, a farmer named Gerald Braun was riding his tractor on his property in the town of Techita, about four miles outside of Fond du Lac. And he was near a wooded area along McCabe Road, just off Highway forty nine, when he spotted two trash bags. That looked like they had just been tossed from the road. Like somebody just driving by, just tossed them out the window. And when he went and opened up these trash bags inside were Lisa's clothes, 
costume and a bag for candy. And then inside the other bag was her battered naked body. After finding this, the farmer called the police, but the people in the community actually got there before they did. The Reverend Clarence Nikolai climbed a barbed wire fence, cutting his hands in order to get to Lisa's body. He then knelt down next to her to pray and was sobbing with grief. Wow. As more people arrived, no one could contain their emotions. Everyone was just sobbing uncontrollably. It was just a really sad, sad sight and sad scene to mm-hmm. show up on. I mean, to get there even before the police did, before they could, you know, cover it up and rope it off yeah. and everything. And the community being so involved. Yeah. I'm sure they yeah. were really hoping for a different outcome. I'm sure they weren't sad. expecting this outcome at all. The authorities soon arrived to remove her body, including Sheriff John Cerns, Deputy Raymond Burleton, and head of the state crime lab field team, Alan Limomowski. But it wasn't long before the authorities arrived, including the sheriff, uh, sheriff's deputy, as well as the head of the state crime lab, as well as a special investigator for the district attorney's office, all showed up to examine the scene. Lisa's funeral was held at Emanuel Trinity Lutheran Church on November 6, 1973. The whole community came out to support Lisa's family. It was so packed that there wasn't even room standing inside the church. Nine entire rows were taken up just by Lisa's Girl Scout troop and her classmates. Wow. Yeah, a lot of people. I mean, this community really hurt from this. Marianne chose a white casket for Lisa and dressed her in the same dress that she wore for picture day. Marianne did Lisa's hair herself, just like she did every morning for school. The day after the funeral, Marianne actually found a note tucked in Lisa's Bible in her room. Lisa had written uplifting messages like, if you ask Jesus to take over, you will begin a new life. And smile, God loves you. Marianne treasured this note and believed it showed how kind and wonderful that Lisa was. Soon after Lisa's body was found, police started questioning witnesses again. They talked to everyone in the neighborhood and pieced together which houses Lisa had stopped at for Halloween. The day after Lisa disappeared, they had questions for Gerald Turner. They were suspicious of him and thought that he could possibly be involved, but they had no evidence. Well, right, because there's only three houses that her mother said she could go to, and one of them was Gerald Turner, and probably the last house she went to was Mm. Gerald Turner's house. As long as she obeyed that, then it seems kind of obvious. Yeah. For months, the police kept going back to Gerald, questioning him, because they just had a feeling that he might be involved. At some point while they were talking to him, his story started to change a bit. His details weren't really consistent. And so they asked him to take a polygraph test. And at first he refused, but in mid-1974, he agreed to take the test. And the results were inconclusive, but it gave police more information to work with. They knew that his house was the last one that Lisa had stopped at on Halloween. So he was very likely the last person to see her alive. And after nine months, Gerald finally confessed. He was arrested on August 8th, 1974 and charged with first degree murder. I'm sure they did like tons of interrogating of him. And obviously he knew with the lie detector test that the truth was probably going to come out at some point. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure they just kept questioning him over and over again, try to trip him up in his stories, try to try to basically put, you know, pressure him into giving a confession uh, of what really happened to Lisa. Well, I think he also was experiencing a lot of guilt, and we will talk about this more, but he didn't plan to kill her, actually. That was not part of his original plan. So I think he was overwhelmed with the guilt of killing this little girl. Could be, for sure. That same month, her mom, Marianne, gave birth to her third child, which was kind of a blessing for their family after such a hard year, and her name was Susan. With a toddler and a newborn, Marianne spent the next year going to court and testifying for her daughter. Now, the details of Gerald's confession are pretty horrific, just to warn you. So according to Gerald, his account of Halloween 1973 went like this. He told police that Arlene, his girlfriend, took their baby to Pumpkin Place without him. And while she was gone, Lisa came by their home. The door was open and she looked around the corner to see if anybody was home. And when she saw Gerald, he said her face lit up. And at that point, he felt very sexually motivated to attack her. But he said he didn't want to kill her. Gerald then took her to the bedroom. He stripped off her clothes. And sadly, he raped her. And this was a very violent attack. And at one point, he noticed that she had stopped breathing. So he tried to do CPR, but she was already gone. When he heard Arlene get home around 7.15, he put socks over his hands to avoid leaving fingerprints and move Lisa to the bathtub. 
Arlene found him sitting on the couch in a robe, and they were supposed to go to Arlene's mother's when she got back, but Gerald told her he wasn't feeling well and told her to go without him. Arlene left the house briefly, but then remembered her mom wouldn't be home for another hour. And when she came back inside the home, Gerald kept going into the bedroom. And the way that he was doing it was very strange to her, but she didn't think much of it at the time. And after a little while, she ended up leaving again with the baby, and Gerald went right back to work, trying to cover up his horrendous crime. He wasn't even sure if Lisa was dead, but he shoved her body into a garbage bag anyway. He wiped off Lisa's shoes and the zipper on her coat to get rid of Prince and shoved her belongings in another garbage bag. He said he then drove a few miles outside of town and dumped both bags in a field. And Gerald's confession wasn't the only evidence that investigators had, because they also found hair that matched his inside one of the garbage bags and on Lisa's body. When the medical examiner's report came back, it said her cause of death was asphyxiation following a heart attack, but she wasn't smothered or strangled. She had actually died of shock at the physical and emotional trauma of being raped. I have to say that's one of the saddest things I've ever heard in all of my time looking into true crime cases to just die of shock. Yeah. You know how scared she was? Yeah. Yeah. That's terrifying. Coming from someone who she liked someone that she knew and that's who it normally is in these cases. Yeah. It's always somebody really close to you that you're so shocked that they're doing this fucking sick. Yeah. So what was his plan? If he wasn't going to kill her, what would his plan have been? Just be like, don't tell anyone and send her off. Yeah. I mean, that happens a lot or yeah, threaten her does, and be like, I will kill you if you tell anybody. I guess he could have That's done that. That's what a lot yeah, of people but do. She may not have listened. Maybe I just, not. I, part of me doesn't believe that he didn't intentionally want her to die. But I guess it does make sense because that's what they determined her cause of death was shock. So right. I guess he, but maybe he was planning to kill her anyway. We don't know that. We no, don't know we, what his intentions were if that didn't happen. No, we don't. And I mean, this was still an extremely violent attack. So, you know, it could have easily, maybe he, he had one thought in his mind, but then once he was actually carrying out the attack, he was like, you know, it was, le- he knew it was going to lead to that. You know, it's one thing yeah. to premeditate. I'm going to, you know, if this girl ever comes to my house alone, I'm going to take advantage of her, but it's another right. to, you know, actually be in the moment. And, you know, he's clearly already struggling with pedophilia and, and these thoughts and feelings of, of, you know, wanting to commit violent acts on children. Yeah. So I'm sure his sick ass was, you know, st- kind of looking at her for a while and yeah. just was waiting for an opportunity. And this was it. Yeah. Like, I wonder how spur of the moment it was. Yeah. Really. I, Cause I, he I tries to paint it as this big spur of the moment thing. Maybe he thought he'd get some, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what he's thinking. It doesn't look good either way, but no. I well, don't know. Part of me just thinks that he might be lying about his intent about killing her. Yeah. There's always a, I mean, can you, are you going to trust this guy? What he says? Yeah. No, I mean, he's clearly sick in the head and, you know, there's probably been thoughts of murdering and things like that too. Disgusting. But it's estimated that about 1% of violent sexual assault cases can result in this type of death. So it's very, very rare, I guess, based on this statistic that somebody actually dies of shock from uh, rape, I guess. So, or sexual assault. So that's, yeah, it's really scary. But because of the nature of this crime, and obviously it was to a cute little girl, the news really spread throughout all of Wisconsin and hit headlines around the country as well. And of course, the media loves to give names, and I mean, the police do too, uh, to murderers and suspects like this, and they ended up calling Gerald Turner the Halloween killer. Gerald's case went to trial, and during the trial, he ended up recanting his confession, of course. He said that the police were harassing him constantly and he just wrote the confession to get them to shut up. But multiple women testified during the trial that Gerald was abusive and had raped them as well, including the 15 year old babysitter as well as two of his exes. So he's a serial rapist at this point uh, based on these other witnesses. Robert Owens, who's a psychologist who met with Gerald while he was in prison, testified that Gerald had cold disregard for people, especially women. He had no conscious control over his impulses for pleasure and no ability to conform to society's expectations around sexual violence. The doctor who performed Elisa's autopsy, Dr. Robert Kolvosky, also testified to explain what death by shock really meant. And to sum it up, it's very, very graphic. Basically, the trauma that she 
endured during this attack caused basically caused her heart to stop. I mean, it was that traumatic that um, her body just shut down. Right. And the heart attack didn't stop blood circulation. Oxygen wasn't being circulated and carbon dioxide wasn't being removed, which caused the asphyxiation. The doctor pretty much said that she died immediately after the attack or even during it at some point. With all the evidence and witness testimony stacked against him, the jury did find Gerald guilty of second degree murder, as well as enticing a child for moral purposes, indecent behavior with a child and sexual perversion. They rejected the first degree murder charge though. And this meant that Gerald couldn't receive the full life sentence because with first degree murder, there's gotta be that premeditation. You gotta be able to prove that Gerald planned this out to do, to kill her in order to, for that charge to stick in most cases. And it, it looks like it didn't. And he got second degree murder instead. And that's why I think he was lying, you know, cause yeah. he knew that. Yeah. I mean, he could have definitely been lying, but Gerald was sentenced to 38 years and six months in prison. Not enough. And that's he's disgusting. Yeah, I know that's, you should be life in prison for yeah, that for absolutely. sure. Absolutely. 38 like, years, you know, even he's in worse. his twenties. So he's going to get out. Ugh, it's crazy. That's, that's so gross. And he started serving his prison time on February 3rd, 1975. And during the sentencing, Judge Milton Meister stressed that Gerald showed no regret and no remorse for his actions. But Marianne still remembers the moment Gerald turned to her during the trial and said, I didn't mean to do it. And this town was changed forever after this, especially Halloween. This became a daytime holiday, no one out after dark, and definitely no kids by themselves. And cities across Wisconsin followed this as well, and even passed laws about the day and the hours that kids were supposed to be out trick-or-treating. In Fond du Lac, there was a designated time the Sunday before Halloween from 3.30 to 5.30. Even in Milwaukee, kids could only go out from 1 to 4, again, the Sunday before Halloween. In the late 1970s, Gerald started working for the prison's kitchen dock. He received shipments and unloaded food and other items from trucks. He did his work and kept his head down, according to other inmates. And in prison, men like him were called baby rapers by other inmates. So they were despised by everyone. Yeah. Yeah. You don't child do well. rapists do not have, have a good, have a good in prison at all. Nope. I mean, even other violent offenders don't like people that take advantage of children and rightfully so. If he even looked at any of them, they might jump him and other inmates would be happy to just join in. Yeah. That's probably also why he was such a model prisoner, as they say, yeah. because he had just kept his head down Couldn't the whole time. And, yeah. yeah. But even though he was, you know, playing it safe and under the radar in prison does not mean that he wasn't still violent and dangerous records in his profile showed that he pulled out at least three of his own teeth instead of waiting for the dentist. Pretty but, savage. Yeah. George Smullen, the educational director at the prison, was in charge of approving and reading materials sent to prisoners, like books and magazines. And one day an envelope came in for Gerald Turner, and it had a magazine from another country filled with pictures of hardcore sexual bondage. And he didn't approve this based on Gerald's violent sexual crime. And Gerald got a written explanation for why this wasn't approved. I mean, duh. Yeah. Why would they let somebody like that have sexual bondage? But he was Hard, not happy yeah. with this. Of course not. He responded by suing George Smullen and the warden. Yeah, good luck with that. A year and a half later, a judge ruled in Gerald's favor and ordered that he be allowed to have the magazine. Isn't that, that that's like everything wrong with our system right there. Like the yeah. fact that they would do something like that. Just disgusting. Why does this guy need need this in the first place? He's in prison. At some point while in prison, he wrote a letter to Lisa that wasn't released until 1999, but the letter was basically a confession. The letter said, I doubt that I could ever fully realize the terror you experienced at my hands. I can still see you standing in the doorway with that felt hat beaming at having recognized me. Then I see the delight in your eyes turn to fear as I close the door behind you. The rest of my life, I will have to live with what I did to you. On that night, I became a monster. After serving 17 years and eight months of his sentence, Gerald was released on parole for good behavior. That's ridiculous. 17 yeah. years out of yep. a 30. He should have got life in prison, no parole, but he got 38 years with parole. I'm and surprised he gets out at 17. this actually happened. But again, he could have just been on his best behavior because he couldn't interact with other inmates or really, you know, stand out in any way. Yeah, definitely gives you a reason to keep a low profile for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. And just get, get, try to get along with everybody and be a good prisoner. 
So he was released in 1992 and the people of Wisconsin were very upset and they organized protests about it. Imagine her parents having to deal with that. Terrible. And because of his parole, Wisconsin created the sexual predator law known as Turner's law. This allows them to send a convicted sex offender to a mental institution after being paroled if they believe the person was still a danger to society. This isn't a law already. I know. This I, seems I don't like understand. <laughs> like a no brainer. Like what this person's clear just because they serve time in prison doesn't mean they're being rehabilitated right. from these severe mental disturbing issues that they have. Yeah. Like they need to be I feel like you go from prison to, you know, under the care of a doctor or psychiatrist where they can really, they should be be the ones that determine who, who's safe and who's not. I agree. Not the prison or the parole board. I mean, in some of these cases, I don't think they should even get out at all. I would rather them just stay in, but if they're going to get out, like I'd rather them go have time, you know, and try to get them to a better place mentally. If they're going to rejoin society. I mean, that seems absolutely logical. (laughs) I don't know. Well, I was going to say a lot of times in prison, I feel like you have even more struggles with mental health because again, you're not being rehabilitated. You're just sitting in a box Mm -hmm. and being mistreated a lot of times and not really even being treated like a human at all. Like you're certainly typically not learning how to like get back into society as a productive member. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I feel like that's really, it's just really sketchy how our system in general just kind of locks people up, sends them out, locks mm-hmm. people up. And it's, mm-hmm. it's created because most of the time they're going to come back to prison because they're not able, they don't have the skills right. to succeed outside when it's all they know. Yeah. That's, they've pretty much set them up for failure. Mm-hmm. I mean, and not to give this guy any symp- sympathy no, we're no, talking no, no, about no, in no. general. Yeah, fuck this guy. But yeah, I mean, I'm sure his mental health wasn't great after years of being, I mean, talking to nobody. He had no friends in jail and I mm-hmm. can't imagine you'd be in a great place just but, being thrown back into the world. Yeah, it seems that's what stupid. I'm saying. Just the fact that he's able to maybe get out, like that's really scary because I'm sure that he is now possibly even more mentally ill with other, like for other reasons yeah. besides the reasons that he already was mm-hmm. because of the fact that he just spent a lot of time in prison just sitting there. And I think this happens a lot with, folks who, yeah. you know, just are sitting in there and then they come out and then they, you know, re have re- new issues exactly. or their yeah. issues are magnified. Yeah. Well, is his root issue solved? No prison doesn't. All so. prison does is put you in a timeout for right. years. Yeah. That doesn't solve the root issue here, which is pedophilia mm-hmm. and, you know, being a predator. Mm-hmm. So that was never tackled in prison and all year round like, is oh, other predators. This time, send them out. Mm-hmm. So well, I, I don't get it. It's what, what's the point of this at all? What's the point of prison? You're putting somebody in time out for years, but yet the actual issue with that person is never resolved or worked on. So to send them to a mental institution seems like, why aren't we doing this already? Like this makes no sense. So Gerald was sent to a halfway house. So pretty good. And this was in Milwaukee. And then he moved into his own apartment. Eventually Lisa's family and many in their community were devastated that this killer was now free. I would be so fucking mad. Can't even imagine the feelings that and thoughts that went through their head when they found out he was being released. And- Seriously. And the people of Fond du Lac came together to file a lawsuit claiming that Gerald's release date had been miscalculated by the state. Yeah, miscalculated because it should have been never released. Yeah, seriously. And the state actually did admit that there was a mistake and he was sent back into prison in 1993 by Wisconsin Court of Appeals. But then their decision was reversed by the state Supreme Court in 1994 and he was released from prison again that July. So this family is just being jerked around Constantly. Yeah, that's that's horrible. Under Turner's law, which was created because he had been paroled early, Gerald was sent to a psychiatric hospital. Well, that's good. At least they got the law passed so that mm-hmm. at least he didn't, wasn't back on the street and he was, yeah. you know, going to be watched by somebody. And the Department of Justice could keep him there as long as they proved that he was a sexually violent person that would likely reoffend. Which I think for him was very high. Very high chances. In 1998, Gerald went on trial to determine if he should stay locked up at the psychiatric hospital or be released on parole. During this trial, four women testified that he had violently raped them, including the 15-year-old babysitter, both of his ex-wives, and his two ex-girlfriends. So pretty much everybody from the opposite sex he's ever been with is 
experienced this violence and there was probably others that were afraid to come forward or didn't want to yeah. be part of it. Yeah. There could have been even unsolved cases. That, so I mean, he will do it again. Yeah. He's clearly a serial rapist. Mm-hmm. But a psychiatrist testified on Gerald's behalf that he believed there was a 20% chance that he would commit another violent sexual crime within the next seven years. How do you calculate that? What's the know. formula I mean, yeah, for that? Seriously, yeah. how do you determine like, that? 20% chance? What What are you spinning? But if there's a, any chance, why would they yeah, release him? 20% chance that, that could happen. That's not good chances. No, it should be 0.00% chance. I guess they even gave him medication to lower his sex drive to help him resist his sexual urges, which basically proved that he could reoffend. Yeah. Because it didn't do anything for him. He probably didn't even take him. What are they watch him take these pills? Like, it's just a joke. Mm -hmm. It's just a formality. It's like a checkbox. You know, they're just checking off the box. Oh, we gave him meds up. Well, Mm -hmm. you know, he's better now. Yeah, exactly. But despite these testimonies and evidence that was presented, the jury ruled that the state did not prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Gerald was likely to reoffend and commit another sexual crime. So he was released on parole again and sent to a foster halfway house in Madison. The conditions of his parole were that he be placed on electronic monitoring and that he was only allowed to leave the halfway house if he was supervised while doing so. And he was not allowed to be in contact with any children or possess any pornography. Well, that's good. That's something at least. He was allowed to have it in jail though. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) What the the hell? Once again, the community was outraged that this guy was free and you know, it was kind of just like send him, send him back into society and see what happens. Isn't good plan. It? Yeah. Good plan. Just crazy. Apparently Gerald was very frustrated with all the attention this case got and he hated being called the Halloween killer. He believed that if he had murdered Lisa on any other day other than Halloween, nobody would give a damn. He's quoted saying, what, what, what are you talking about, dude? I think nobody would well, give a damn. I guess he must mean that like I'm the, the media, Halloween killer. Right. The media. They wouldn't give me a name right. and you know, wouldn't Which, be as famous as it maybe, is. Maybe, maybe that's true. We may not be covering it if it yeah. wasn't a Halloween case, because of course when we looked up Halloween cases, this is the one. Yeah, that's true. That's I, that is a, a good point, I guess. In June of 1998, he was working in the kitchen at the halfway house when he threatened a caseworker with a butcher knife. So state prison officials tried to revoke his parole after this incident, but a state division of hearings and appeals administrator decided to you know we'll let this one slide. Time after time, the justice system failed and continued to let this violent child rapist and murderer go free. Gerald tried to find work outside the halfway house. He applied to more than 100 companies and government agencies even, but was turned down every single time. Because, yeah, who would want to work with this guy? No one. But when the waste management of Madison refused to hire him, his caseworker advised him to sue for discrimination. And Wisconsin is one of just several states where employers aren't allowed to consider prior convictions during the hiring process. So in the summer of 1999, Gerald filed a complaint with the State Department of Workforce Development against Waste Management of Madison, and he claimed they refused to hire him because he had a criminal record. Waste Management claimed they didn't hire him because it would violate his parole. The job involved being around both dangerous materials and kids were brought to the facility for tours as well. So yeah, there's, and there's a chance that, you know, he might offend again. Gerald was granted a hearing though. So the waste management settled the case out of court for an undisclosed amount of money. Oh, I can't believe that he got money out of this. I know. In 2003, Gerald was living in the foster community correctional house in Dane County. And during a routine checkup, Gerald's parole officer found that he had pornographic material in multiple places. He had images and videos on his computer. He had videotapes and he had magazines. And all this was in violation of his parole and not allowed as a registered sex offender. So clearly he has, he's not changed at all Mm -mm. is clearly the same issue as, Mm -hmm. you know, way before all these years. Yeah. Nothing locked up. Yeah. Nothing has changed with him while living at the halfway house. Gerald had also tried to unlock the playboy channel and he tried to rent movies about serial killers, even three separate times. One of the movies was even about a young girl being brutally murdered. Well, that's very concerning, right? I mean, he's trying, he's trying to get porn. He's clearly got a pornography addiction Clearly, and he's fascinated by serial killers Mm -hmm. because he probably at this point wants to be a serial killer or he already is for all we know. know. 
Based on these parole violations, he was sent back to prison and sentenced to 15 years. And his new release date was February 1st, 2018. And Lisa's family was relieved that finally this man was back in prison. But as his release date got closer, Marianne started to take action. In October of 2017, she started a petition to keep him locked up under Turner's law. She believed it would only be a matter of time before he offended again. The Wisconsin Department of Justice also tried to keep him locked up using Turner's law, which again would send him to a mental facility once he was released from prison. They argued that even if he was heavily supervised and constantly monitored, Gerald still broke the conditions of his parole. So the halfway house thing is not working. It's clearly not helping him. It's, it's, he's just sliding by trying to break the rules and not get caught. But for him to qualify to be permanently institutionalized under Turner's law, the state needs to prove that he has mental disorders that predispose him to commit violent sex crimes. Later in 2018, Gerald was released again, but he was sent to a treatment center in Wisconsin, and this center is run by the Department of Health Services and the state's Sexually Violent Persons Program. His lawyers, Robert Peterson and Evan White, argued to get the case transferred to Dane County, where Gerald was living when he violated his parole. His lawyers believed that he couldn't get a fair trial in Fond du Lac County. In April 2018, a judge agreed to move the case to Dane County, though, and in 2019, an appeals judge reversed this decision and ruled that the case stay in Fond du Lac. So as of now, Gerald's next hearing is scheduled for October 29th, 2020. So literally in a week as of recording this episode. And what's crazy is that he could be released two days before the 47th anniversary of Lisa's murder. I thought that was last year too. It was the same yeah. way. Yeah, it was it Just was around the same year. time. Every year it gets yeah pushed back again. That those poor people that every year in October they have to deal with this yeah. right around like relive the time. it all again. Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh, because this terrible. guy wants wants to get out. And on Gerald's side, his lawyers continue to fight for his freedom, claiming that he's not going to commit you know any sexual act of violence anymore, and they don't have proof of a qualifying mental illness to hold him any longer. So it is very possible that he may go free. The prosecutor's office does think, though, that they have enough evidence to keep him locked up or to keep him in a mental institution because obviously, you know, there's a strong possibility he will offend again. And a psychologist has also diagnosed him with pedophilic disorder. And what's also interesting to note is that at one point in 2002, Gerald actually claimed that he had many more victims, including 10 minors and 14 adults. But this admission that he made can't be used in the new case of his. That's crazy. So he's literally a, probably a serial killer, serial rapist. Like he's Golden State. He could be Golden State killer for all we know. And this guy's about yeah. to go free again. That's that's how big of a deal this absolutely is. Absolutely terrifying. Do you think it will actually go through? I don't think so. No. I don't either. I don't. I, I really I hope, hope not. not. Oh my gosh. And I mean, he's already a mental institution. Like he should be in prison. Yeah, I agree. For life. Yeah, he should be. So at the very least, the state can do is keep him in a mental mm -hmm. or a treatment center, as they call it, for people like him. But Lisa's family continues to move forward. Her sister, Susan, who was born after Lisa died, has spoken out about her childhood. She said that her and her brother, Michael, grew up with trauma after the aftermath of Lisa's murder. And I'm sure just seeing their parents grieve. And this guy really get out hard. over and over again. Yeah, yeah, that's traumatizing for sure. Marianne was overprotective of Susan and Michael, and she had trouble bonding with them. They weren't allowed to celebrate Halloween, and every fall their family seemed to fall apart with grief. <sighs> I can imagine. It's so fucked up. And every Halloween to have it, of course you're going to be reminded. I wouldn't let my other kids trick-or-treat either. There's no way yeah, I could let them yeah. after that. For a long time, all Susan knew about Lisa was that she got put in a bag and thrown in a ditch. And as a kid, every time she saw a garbage bag, she thought there might be a dead body inside. And that was very traumatic for her. Yeah, I, I believe that. Yeah. God. Marianne is still triggered by the sight of a garbage bag to this day. Meanwhile, Lisa's childhood best friend, Ann Parker, spent decades feeling guilty that she wasn't, you know, there with Lisa that night. And 38 years after Lisa's murder, Ann found Marianne on Facebook and contacted her. Both women live in Florida and they got together. In 2011, they decided to take a trip to Wisconsin the week after Halloween, and they visited Lisa's grave in the spot where her body was found. And it was a very healing experience for both of them. 
Marianne and Susan have gotten close to Anne, and Susan said that they call each other sisters. Marianne says that she continues to pray for sex offenders and their victims. She says that she has forgiven Gerald, but she can't forgive his sin. Yeah. I mean, you got to have closure some way. And yeah, I guess that's for some people. Yeah. You know, forgiving the people that do the most heinous things against them and saying, you know, you got to let go of that hatred and that anger at some point because, I mean, that will destroy them too. So, yeah. Um, my therapist always tells me it's like s- drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Mm. It's true. Hanging yeah. on to anger yeah, like that is. in your body. Yeah, it is. Mm-hmm. It's a very good analogy for sure. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it can be very healing to forgive. I always think that is such an interesting concept. I love to hear op- people's opinions on whether or not they think they'd have the strength to forgive someone who murdered their loved one. I don't think I could, you know, quite know until, or unless I had, don't say until, <laughs> but unless I had something like that happen to me, you know what I mean? But, yeah. Yeah. Well, hopefully Gerald does not get released yeah. uh, back to the streets in the public. Yeah. We will update you guys soon on that yeah i mean that's happening in literally a week so uh, in the next couple episodes we'll probably have an update on that and what happens yeah. and what decision they come to your mustache is like two seconds from falling <laughs> I know. Yeah, what's going I know. on over here well, i have it's a mustache on by a thread <laughs> it is it's like <laughs> it was really hard to take you seriously at times there were several insane. times during this episode that i almost laughed but it would be like a really weird moment yeah. but just it looks really weird looking over and seeing you <laughs> delivering this information i feel weird talking about this dress as this i'm like god i look so weird <laughs> Uh, and it was just like this mustache had like little hairs going up my nostrils throughout the whole thing. And I kept thinking, I was like, I probably looked like I was picking my nose at some point. It was because there's hairs in my mustache. Yeah. 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 But, so they all say whatever, man. But that is the end of crime tober for us. That is. And I know you guys are ready to do some other. Content. Yes. We are going to come back <laughs> next week with a very mind opening, expanding podcast about some very interesting topics for you. So. Um, get ready for it's that. coming off it's coming off we only got a few seconds it's coming off all right i gotta go uh paste my mustache back on before the sesh but yeah yeah we're about to record the sesh so definitely if that'll already be out by the time this is so go check it out if you want more we hope you guys all have a nice halloween stay safe because i mean not only are there crazies out there but also corona please please be responsible with your halloween festivities um but hope you can still enjoy it even though this year is kind of lame <laughs> But yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed this episode of the podcast. If you did, make sure you follow, like, subscribe, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. And yeah, follow us on social media if you haven't already. We're going to post a picture of the full full get-ups on there. So make sure you check that out on Instagram. But until next time, stay safe. And stay spooky.